Gog, Magog, and the second death, the second portion there of Revelation chapter 20. I'll read the whole thing, Revelation 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw so the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years were expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up, on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for your word. I pray, God, that we could learn something from your truths this day, Lord. Help us with clarity of mind, Lord. Help us to be spiritually prepared to hear what you have for us. We'll give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Talking today, like I said, about Gog, Magog, and the second death. Now, beginning in verse 7, it says, When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And so there was a brief reprieve, a brief rest from Satan, obviously, at this time. The dragon, that old serpent, the devil, and Satan are his monikers. After this a thousand years, as promised, he was released from his prison. Now, did prison do as we often think it's supposed to do in our day, and, and, it, should, and it reform him or correct him or, or make him, you know, think again and walk straight and narrow? No, of course not. It doesn't even do that in, in our day for 99% of cases. It actually makes people worse. It makes people more vengeful. It prepares them for the day that they do get released to be, to be more, more adept at actually committing sin and doing wickedness. And, and they, while they're in there, they learn more things. I don't know if that's what Satan was doing, but he was certainly getting more and more angry as time went on. We read in verse 8, it says, And shall go out to deceive the nations that are in the four quarters of the earth. So he wasted no time. He was released after the 1,000 years and went right back to deceiving the nations in the four quarters of the earth. And the entirety of the earth it says here, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So here again, the deception takes place. Gog and Magog, this name is mentioned, and if you've ever followed any prophecy ministries or anything of that sort, people always say, oh, that's Russia and China, or that's, you know, this nation and that nation. They'll have all these ways of explaining Gog and Magog into the context of where we're living now. But very clearly, Gog and Magog here is mentioned after the thousand-year reign of Christ. This is far off. 
This isn't going to be Russia. This isn't going to be China. But rather, we ought to go to the Bible and figure out exactly what it is. It almost seems out of place how it drops in there, but nothing in God's word is actually out of place. He says that four quarters of the earth are deceived, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. So the best thing that you could do is actually go and look it up in a word study and find Gog and Magog. You're only going to find it in one other place. Go to Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel chapter 38. Now, if you just had your Bible and you weren't, um, you know, using word searches or anything like that, um, you would have already read Ezekiel as you were going through it. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, number, so on. You get to Ezekiel. You find out about Gog and Magog. Maybe you wonder what that is. But when it comes up again, certainly the Spirit would give you a little prick in your heart and say, hey, remember you read that? When was that? And you go back to Ezekiel and you find out Gog and Magog mentioned, and it couldn't possibly be Russia and China. But here, Ezekiel, a book that often isn't gone. You don't often go to Ezekiel when you want clarity. <laughs> it's not like, okay, I'm going to find the, the clearest scripture on any topic. I'm going to go to Ezekiel first. No, that, that's pretty much the last place you'd go. Usually when you're reading through Ezekiel, you're struggling to find clarity, and so you're going all other places in the Word of God trying to gather information to clarify the, the you know dark context and dark passages you find in the book of Ezekiel. But here, very clearly, Ezekiel 38, Gog and Magog are mentioned. And we're just going to read through these portions of scriptures only because I might not be back here ever again, and because it's explained in Revelation as something that happens after the thousand years, after God has bound Satan, Gog and Magog, and this time shows up here, and we can learn from it. Look in verse 1 of Ezekiel chapter 38. It says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And so those names don't mean a lot to me, though I do see that term Gog mentioned. And for whatever reason, it just seems to ring the same as God. And I don't know if that's just a coincidence, one letter change there, but Gog is clearly a nation in the land of Magog that is against the Lord. And God's indicating he too is against them. So the feeling is clearly mutual. Verse 4, it says, And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. So in Revelation chapter 20, it says that Satan went out, deceived the nations, and Gog and Magog, and brought them unto the great battle. But here God's indicating very clearly in verse 4, I will bring thee forth. And all thine army. And so God's obviously in control of the devil even after these a thousand years. And his purposes are being fulfilled in the devil, Satan, that old serpent. And, and though he thinks he's rebelling against God, he's actually perfectly fulfilling his plans. And what we're seeing here and reading here is an insight way back in the Old Testament of what actually happens in the last days after the 1,000 year millennial reign. Verse 5 says, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them. All of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togomorrah, of the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. And so prepared unto battle is what the Lord requires of all these nations. Now all these nations have familiar names and I don't think that's abnormal, right? Here in Ontario we have a London and it was simply just adopted from London, England. We just take names and we reapply them. So Persia and Ethiopia, Libya, seeing those nations named at the last days after the thousand year millennial reign, it shouldn't be confusing for us. It shouldn't be like, whoa, this couldn't possibly be what it's talking about because these nations existed at this time. No, these nations have always existed. We'll rename them. We'll, we'll bring those names to remembrance. Maybe we'll remember the land mass and continue to call it that after the thousand years. I don't know how it's going to work. But anyways, God here is saying, be prepared. I'm bringing you forth, all thine army, all these nations that I'm naming, Gog, Magog, bring them with you, be a guard unto them. Be, be the one that is strongest among them. Verse 8 says this, and this is again, what is going to give us clarity about what timing is being mentioned here. After many days, thou shalt be visited. 
in the latter years thou shalt come out or thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely in them. So many days after Ezekiel's direct context and the people that he's talking to, he says, in the latter years, Gog and Magog will come to a land that is brought back from the sword. I believe that they have been restored from a sword that drove through them. I believe that they have recovered and now they are safely dwelling in this land is what the Bible here is indicating. It says they've been brought back from the sword. Perhaps a sword went through and we know that actually that happened before the millennial reign. There was great persecutions, tribulations, great battles, all sorts of things that happened in the promised land. And when that was fulfilled, there, of course, would have been a time of recovery. They would have been brought back from that as Jesus enters into the scene, becomes king of kings, lord of lords in the earth, ruling and reigning with his kings and priests. And all of that takes place and transpires. And now, after the thousand years is fulfilled, they are all dwelling safely. The Bible says those last three words, dwell safely, who? All of them. Okay, so the whole world here, or at least the nation there of Israel, is dwelling at safely. Now, what it says here about Gog and Magog in verse 9 is, Thou shalt ascend, rise up, and come like a storm. Okay? Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, and many people with thee. And if you've ever seen a great big storm coming in, I was thinking today, um, about what it was like in, in Guyana. So every day, pretty much the same weather happens. It's always 31 degrees. It's always hot and sunny. But right around noon to about 2 o'clock, you'll see a cloud rise up. And that cloud becomes this little white speck, and it just grows and billows and becomes this great storm. The, the, the rain comes down like I've never seen before, and it's a shock. It's a surprise. It just takes you over, and then suddenly it's gone. That cloud just disappears. It's gone. Clear skies back to 31 degrees pretty much every single day. And actually, I look at my app every once in a while, and it's always the same. 31, 31, 31, 31, 31, sunny, right? They don't often report that you know, sudden blast of weather that comes because it is exactly that. It rises up just like Gog is described here it ascends and comes like a storm and it's almost gone as soon as it arrives so this is the description of Gog as he comes suddenly to destroy this land that is at peace dwelling safely verse 10 it says thus saith the Lord God it shall come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind and thou shalt think an evil thought and I believe that this is more or less likely that this is part of the devil deceiving the nations Gog and Magog inserting into their mind that evil thought whatever that evil thought is I believe it's that of taking over and attacking these nations that are at peace and what more wicked of a thought could you have than to as a great army as a great multitude with nations upon nations upon nations revelation says they're numbered as the sand of the sea what more evil of a thought could you have than i'm going to take over these nations that are what at peace that have already recovered from the sword that have been brought back from the sword gathered out of many people that are lying at peace where they had once been waste and your thought is i'm going to take them over and that's exactly what he has in mind when it says in verse 11 and thou shalt say here's the evil thought i will go up to the land of unwalled villages i will go to them that are at rest that dwell safely all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates gog here and that great army says i'm going to go to those at rest i'm going to go to those that have unwalled cities that are at peace dwelling safe without walls without protection the weak I'm going after them, is the thought that comes to his mind. And why would he think such an evil thing? Well, he's motivated by what? Verse 12, to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn 
thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwelt in the midst of the land. Verse 13, Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, and to take a great spoil? It's a shock to those nations what are you here for you're going to take a spoil of us you're going to you're, you're going to attack us i don't know if you've ever been in a situation where where you're outnumbered or outarmed almost all you ever have is words what are you going to take what are you going to do you're going to hear you're going to take me down you're going to beat me up you're going to rough me up i'm unarmed i'm 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 there's nothing i have to defend myself. i won't defend myself and exactly what these nations are saying what an evil and wicked thought of somebody or some nation or some group of people to think I'm going to attack these weak and and unarmed and unguarded and vulnerable people evil indeed to want to destroy the vulnerable this is why we think abortion is so wicked what's more vulnerable than a newborn babe this is why we believe that pedophilia and or, or grooming of, of pe people that are younger than you is so wicked because they're vulnerable and it's a wicked, evil thought to think to yourself, I am going to take a spoil, what I want. I am going to make a prey and get uh, what I desire out of the weak, out of the vulnerable, out of those that are not safe, out of those that are unguarded. And, I'm protected. and that's the evil thought that comes and I believe that it's of Satan. The Bible says that he came out to deceive the nations. And here in the context of Ezekiel 38, he says, Thou shalt think an evil thought, Gog Magog. Perhaps the devil directly motivated this thought. Verse 14, it says, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord, In that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? The answer to that question is yes, absolutely. They knew it because they mentioned it above. They knew they were unwalled. They knew they dwelled safely. They knew they had no guard nor protection, bars nor gates. And it was planned so. The wickedness of their thoughts was that we're going to destroy these that cannot defend themselves. Verse 15 says, And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee. All of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. And I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. And so while Gog knew exactly the scenario, it seems God himself knew the exact scenario and even use the scenario to draw Gog to be sanctified in the eyes of the heathen. He says, you're coming against my people in the latter days, and I will even bring thee against my land to the end that what? The heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. So it seems like in the last days, in the latter days, which it mentions here again, that there were heathen that knew not God. Now, in our terms, it didn't take very long for people to forget God. Even, even in our lifetime, we can forget God and, and not bring him to remembrance and start to forsake him. So in the, in the context of even with Jesus ruling and reigning on earth, we find nations, heathen nations, that have forgotten God. And so he uses Gog and his assembly of hordes of heathen coming upon his people Israel to ensure that these nations know him and that he himself, the Lord God, is sanctified before their eyes. God knows and intends to be sanctified out of this. Look at verse 17. I'm going to read through the end of the chapter just to describe how God intends to use Gog to be sanctified in the eyes of the nations. Verse 17, Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years, and I would bring thee against them? 
And it shall come to pass at that same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. And I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Verse 23, look at this. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. In the last days, God's got the same business, and that's to be glorified, to be sanctified, to be deemed holy, and to be known of the nations. Even at this time, he wants to be known. And throughout time, we've seen it. He sent Israel to a light to lighten the Gentiles. By what? Their example of holy living and the temple sacrifices that pointed to the Christ that would come. So that nations, we learn about in Deuteronomy, would look on them and say, what nation is this that has, that has, has uh, um, you know, judgment so righteous? Has God so nigh unto them? And people were to be drawn unto that and want to join up with the nation of Israel because of the Lord God and because they knew God and God knew them. Then we have the New Testament era where we're told to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature, letting all nations know who the Lord God is, pointing back to the Son that died on the cross for them and trying to get people to glorify God and sanctify God and understand and know Him and have Him know them. And here in the last days, in the latter end, the same thing happens. Nations forget God even though He's ruling and reigning from earth. They forget him. They want nothing to do with him. They've drawn away and pulled aside and decided that they're going to seek after their own gods, perhaps, or follow their own way, as our hearts often deceive us to do. And God has the same business. I want to be magnified. I want to be sanctified. I want all nations to know that I am the Lord. And here he's using a great battle where he summons through the deception of Satan all nations to gather against him, and he will destroy them in the latter days. Verse 39 continues, verse 1, it says, or chapter 39, verse 1, Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee and will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel and I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thine right hand. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands and the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. That's such an interesting image there in verse 3. They're standing there armed with bows and arrows, and God just smacks them out of your hand. What are you going to do with that? just smites the bow right out of their hands and causes that the arrows would fall out of their right. And it's an interesting picture because what use is an arrow if you don't have a bow? So God just quickly smack, disarms them, smites the bow out of their hand, and they're just left shaking, crumbling, dropping the arrows that they would have shot with those bows. God promises here in verse 5, you're going to fall in the open field. Why? Because I have spoken it. Thus saith the Lord, it shall come to pass as he had spoken, as all things do, especially when God's in the business of getting glory to himself. He says it, it happens every single time. Verse 6 continues, and it says, And I will send a fire on Magag, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. It looks like even God's people were profaning his holy name. 
Again, you got to think of the image here. Christ is in front of them, ruling and reigning with an iron fist. No doubt, dire punishment came to anyone who would break his holy law at this time, and yet they're polluting his name. They're, they're, they're blaspheming, essentially, his name at this time. And God, again, destroys a heathen nation in front of them, in the midst of them, so that they could know the same thing he desires the heathen to know, that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. And I like that. That's different. You usually say the Holy One of Israel. He's now in Israel. The Holy One in Israel. He's there. He's present. He's ready. And he's visible. And yet people are still rebelling against him. What a sight. What a thought. Verse 8 says, Behold, it shall it is come, and it is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken, and they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers and the bows and the arrows and the handstaves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years, so that they shall take no wood out of the field. Neither cut down any out of the forest. For they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoiled them, and rob those that robbed them. Here's a great reset. Those that robbed are robbed themselves. Those that spoiled are spoiled themselves. They've reaped what they've sown. The old law of God prevails even into the latter end, where you will reap what you sow. And these nations enter in and they try to take over this weak, um, this weak nation that really has no weapons, no need for them. They don't even put bars and gates up because they're living at peace at this time. And this horde comes in, set, uh, led by the devil himself to destroy them. And God has it so that he smites their weapons out of their hands, destroys them, has them fall in the fields by ravenous birds and beasts of the field. And when that's all done, this great reset takes place where they're taking the weapons of war that were pointed against them and re bringing them up, spoiling of them, gathering them together. And there was no need to even go into the field and lob a tree down to get wood for your fire, to heat your house, to make your food. You would just simply burn the weapons. And there were seven years of this, burning weapons with fire, bucklers, bows, arrows, handstaves, spears, all these things that were used against them are now providing for them. And it's amazing how God uses attacks that come against us to actually provide for us something that we need, whether that's spiritual growth, whether that's provision in some other way. God has a way of taking all things and working them together for good to those that love him, to those that are the called according to his purpose. And I'm glorifying God that he's doing the same thing in the latter end. God has not changed. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. You can bank on that. You can count on that. So there's the reset. Now we have a cleansing. Look at verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the noses of the passengers, and there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying them, that they may cleanse the land. Seven years of burning the weapons, seven months here of burying the dead. Just hordes of people just falling. You can imagine how much of a, how much of a battle took place. Or even imagine how outnumbered they were that it would take seven months to bury the bodies. It talks about the passengers. I believe that's just saying the, the passerbyers or the people that are traveling by. Stopping their nose at the stench of this great horde of wicked people that came against God and his people that are dead in the fields. And so seven months take place where they're just simply trying to bury these bodies using the weapons to feed their fire, keep themselves warm, burying the bodies. They've, they've given that valley a name, Haman Gog. That, uh, that, that place is disgusting. We're burying bodies. We're trying to get rid of it. We're trying to cleanse the land is what God says they're doing here at the end of verse 12. Verse 13 says, Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them. Everybody's getting involved in this work. I think I'd get involved too because the faster they're in the dirt, the faster your, your nation starts to smell good again. It stops stinking and stops reeking, right? All the people shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renown of the day. 
Right? This is something that, that they discuss. They always talk about. This is almost like latter end, latter days um, escape in Egypt, the, the Red, sea, Red Sea passing. It's, it's something that they talk about. It's something that they bring to pass. It's a renowned day. It says that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord. They're always going to talk about this. You can see how there's probably potential that, that this isn't the end. I mean, for us right now, but after the thousand years are up, Perhaps there's going to be more Bible coming because there's going to be fulfillment of these types of stories that start to come to pass. You see this, they're talking about a moment of renown. They had the same thing that happened in the time of Egypt. They have the same thing that happened in the time of Christ. Moments of renown that took place. And how did they remember the moments of the renown? Well, God spake the word through holy men of God. And they became words of God that men could hear and see and read. And I think God's probably going to do the same thing in the latter end. He, we don't have any record of that, of course. We have enough. We have the King James Bible, 66 books. In, until Christ comes and tries to do something different, I'm not going to bend from that. I'm not going to waver from the scriptures that we do have. But it's interesting insight that there will be times of renown so far down the future. After Christ is here for a thousand years, after this great battle takes place, men will think to these things as great days where God was glorified in himself. Look at this in verse 14. Talk about reboosting the economy and it says, and they shall sever out men of continual employment, passing through the land to bury the passengers, though, bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth to cleanse it. After the end of seven months shall they search. Verse 15, and the passengers that pass through the land, when any seeth a man's bone, they shall, then shall he set up a sign by it, till the barriers have buried in the valley of Hamongog, and also the name of the city shall be Hamona, thus shall they cleanse the land. And so even after the seven months, when they've pretty much buried everything, the land doesn't stink anymore, passengers are still going to be walking through the land and saying, oh, there's another bone, we missed one, setting a marker. And there's going to be men of continual employment. That their job is to just collect those things and bury them. And that's going to go on and on and on. They're going to be finding pieces of dead people forever, it seems. It's just going to be a continuous employment. Now, it doesn't say eternal, right? But continual gives you the impression of that's going to go on for a long time. How, how devastating was the destruction of these nations that came against God? He wanted to set things right. He wanted people to know that he was the Lord, and he wanted this land cleansed. So he meant business when he destroyed them. Verse 17, it says, And thou, son of man, thus saith the Lord God, Speak unto every feathered fowl and to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves and come. Gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice, that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. Ye shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, and of goats, and of bullocks, all of them fatlings of Bashan. And ye shall eat the fat till ye be full and drink blood till ye be drunken of my sacrifice which I have sacrificed for you thus ye shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots with mighty men and with all men of war saith the Lord God and I will set my glory among the heathen and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed in my hand that I have laid upon them so the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward there's another here great feast of fowl where he gathers the fowl and says it's supper time boys get together start eating these kings start eating these men of renown start eating all of their rams their lambs their goats all of those that are destroyed he gathers these fowls together and again proves himself to be the lord that all shall know that from that day and forward i think it's finally established in the house of israel's mind okay the lord he is god from that day forward let's hope they stick with that verse 23 it says and the heathen shall know that the house of israel went into captivity for their iniquity so god's proving in his people why he did these things and he's done the same over and over and over 
proving that for the iniquity of his people Israel, he stepped in and judged. It says, Therefore hid I my face from them and gave them into the hand of their enemies. So fell they all by the sword, according to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions. Have I done unto them and hid my face from them. The heathen now know, and we ought to know and take heed. The Lord, he is God, and he judges transgressions. He judges sin harshly among the heathen and he'll do the same among his own people the heathen shall know and the house of israel ought to take heed because their sin also was judged at this time look at verse 25 it says therefore thus saith the lord god now will i bring again the captivity of jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of israel and will be jealous for my holy name after that they have borne their shame and all their transgressions whereby they have transgressed against me when they dwelt safely in the land and none made them afraid when i have brought them again from the people and the, gathered them out of their enemies land and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land, and have left none of them anymore. Neither will I hide my face anymore from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. And so the spirit falls upon people, and it seems like at this time, They'll know and never doubt it again that the Lord, he is God from that day forward. The spirit fell upon them and there is that unity. They got the spirit in them now. Now they're united as a house, as a body forever with God. All Israel shall be saved. Remember the apostle Paul talked about it? There it is. So all Israel shall be saved. All the house of Israel are now united. Never again to deny the Lord God that bought them. From that day forward, they will know him, that he is the Lord God. Now, go back to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 9. Now, did you see anything about Russia or China in there? I didn't, so maybe I'm missing something. But <clears throat> it seems to me like there's a last day event. It is very clear when you find the context there in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. Maybe in Ezekiel's day, people were wondering what in the world he was talking about, looking for something like that to come to pass. But see, we hear... That actually is fulfilled here in Revelation chapter 20. And God makes it clear. Gog and Magog, go look that up and I'll tell you what's going to happen at this time. Now we can continue on and look at verse 9, Revelation 20 and verse 9. It says, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And so there's a little of the specifics about how he, how he smite how he smote the bows out of their hand and made them drop their arrows. The nation of Israel here is compassed about. The saints and their camp is compassed about by this great army, Gog Magog, and all the nations that are deceived by Satan into having that wicked thought that they ought to take advantage of these as they are weak and, and, and attack them at the time when they can't defend themselves. God throws down fire from heaven. He's serious in his judgment, devouring them, the Bible says. Verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Now look at this. Where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Giving us assurance to the fact that the beast and the false prophet who went to the lake of fire 1,000 years previous are there unto this day. This is the place where the beast and the false prophet are presently, but he gives them no room for rest because he says, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Even after 1,000 years, the promise of forever and ever torment and burning rings true. Verse 11 says, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Now here we often focus on the great white throne. But look it, the earth here focuses on him. And how did they react when they saw him? They fled away, the earth and the heaven. There was no place found at all for them. We like to talk about the great white throne judgment. We don't often talk about the great white throne judge. And that's who we should really be afraid of, right? 
if we're not saved today, if we have lost family members who are not saved today, who are on their way to being tormented day and night forever and ever in that place where the beast and the false prophet are. We focus on that throne, but it's him that deserves the glory. Heaven and earth flee away. They're displaced at the sight of God Almighty. We ought to give him earnest fear and reverence him properly as due. You could look back and see in verse 5, it says, But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. And now in verse 12 it says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. So here the dead stand. It says in verse 5, they live not again. Now they are living, standing, but they remain dead. That has not changed. The living dead is fulfilled here. They're standing before God. The promise made in verse 5 that they would live not again until that day came to pass. And they are given release from their current state. They're given release from, the Bible is going to show us, death and hell. For just a moment, even though they remain as the dead, they stand before God, before Him, before His great white throne, in a place that even the world and the heaven fleed from for fear. The dead stand. And what happens here? And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. What are these books? What are these books? Keep your finger there in Revelation chapter 20. Go to John. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And back in John chapter 12, you'll find what these books are that are open before the dead, that are now standing before God at this great white throne as he sits upon it. The heaven and earth have fled away, displaced by the sight of God. Books are open. The dead will be judged according to their works out of it. John chapter 12 and in verse 44. John chapter 12, verse 44. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me... Believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. The same that they're going to be standing before at this time of judgment. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to the world to... I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He's talking now to his original and and present context. If you hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. I came not to judge at this time, but to save the world. But look at this. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judge him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in that last day. Christ is giving, as we ought to, the final authority to the word of God, to the words that are spoken by him. He's saying, I'm not going to judge you. I didn't come to judge you. I came to save you. I came to die and be a ransom for many, that whosoever believeth on me should not perish, but have everlasting life. I say, if you believe on me, you're believing on him that sent me. I came to be the light that whoever abides in me, believing on me, trusting in me, will not abide in darkness. If you reject me, if you receive not my words, you have one that judges you. The word shall judge you in that last day. The same that I have spoken shall judge you then at that great white throne. When the Bible says you shall be judged by, according to your works, by the books that are open. For I have not spoken, verse 49, of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment when I, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whosoever I, whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. And I told that to a gentleman the other day, just yesterday. I said, God's message is life everlasting. God's word, final word, his commandment is life everlasting. He isn't wanting you to keep ten commandments. He isn't wanting you to follow a hundred dietary laws. He isn't wanting you to do and perform a thousand different sacrifices. His only command is life everlasting. 
Everlasting life comes by believing in Christ. That's the only commandment that matters at this time. And at the time of judgment, you will be judged whether or not you have believed that commandment. Life everlasting is the final commandment. But if you don't, verse 48, who will judge you at that last day? The words that I have spoken shall judge you at the last day. And if you go back to Revelation chapter 20, it talks about books being open. And you know what books we have? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. You could break it up into Old Testament, New Testament, however you feel. This word will judge you in the last day if you do not believe on Christ. And you do not want to stand before God judged of these words because if I were to stand before God this day judged of these words, I've broken a bunch of them even in the moments proceeding now of this day. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and we had not known sin, but that these words said, Thou shalt not. And so God reveals that to us, and praise and glory be to God that he commanded life everlasting, and his life is in his Son. And when we receive that, we won't face this awful judgment where we stand before him having the book opened before us. And the book says, you're condemned, you're condemned, you've broken this, you've fallen short of this, you cannot keep this, you cannot do this, you cannot serve the Lord, you cannot follow the Lord, you've fallen short, you cannot keep his works, and so you'll be judged according to your your own works and our own deeds are evil the bible records and so our words or these words will judge us at the last day if we're not saved and this whole group here referred to as the dead who for a moment are given life to stand before god it's only a brief reprieve for the time of judgment that is nigh where the book will be open and they'll be judged according to their works. And if they're not found written in the book of life, they'll be judged and condemned of the same. Life everlasting is the ultimate command. Therefore, Christ speaks what he speaks. He spoke in the time that he was here that men would believe. There's a whole gospel, the gospel of John, that was written that men would hear, read it, believe it. That's why Christ came. This book of life, we see, is an inclusive book. This book is a book that all are in, I believe, at a time. You know the Bible records God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? Well, at the time God so loved the world, it was when your name was written therein. Go to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5. It says, Revelation 3 verse 5, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my fathers and before his angels. And again in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Talking about the beast, the false prophet, the antichrist. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. At a time your name was written there. But the promise is if you're not an overcomer. Who is he that overcometh, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Christ? If you haven't overcome by faith in Christ, your name at such a time, whether it's your death or at the time you've rejected God one too many times, will be blot out of the book of life, and you will fall in rank with those that are known as the dead, given life for but a moment. And when they're given life for but a moment, standing before God, he checks the book of life. Your name is not here. You'll be judged according to your works. And he opens the book the Bible, and he judges every man according to their works. And every man indeed that has not believed on Christ will stand at this judgment. Verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You don't want to be blotted out of that book of life. You don't want to stand judged by your works. We go to doors and everyone wants to tell me, I want to be judged by my works. I want to reason with God. I want to tell him all the great things I've done. I want to show him my charity. I want to show him my love. I want to show him all of the great things that I've done for my fellow man. I want to show him my wonderful family. I want to show him all the money I've given. I want my works to stand before God. You don't want 
want that, friend. You don't want to stand before your God with works being the sole purpose or the sole thing that you have to lay before him. Your works of righteousness are as filthy rags in his sight. God wants none of them. And if you're judged according to them, I can turn to any page of the Bible and I bet you I can find a work that you've fallen short of. And if you've fallen short of any work, even like the Bible records in the next passage, if you're fearful, if you're unbelieving, if you're abominable, if you're a murderer, if you're a whoremonger, if you're a sorcerer, if you're an idolater, even if you've loved and made a lie, you will be judged according to your works and fall into the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Your only escape is Christ. Your only escape is being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, given a spotless white garment to wear so that you are given life eternal, following the one command that God wants more than any to you to obey, and that's life everlasting. God so loved the world, but some of them are destined when they reject Him and die a Christless death and enter into eternity they are destined to stand before him given reprieve for a moment from death and hell only to have their works judged and that same death and hell in themselves cast into a lake of fire forever and ever and ever and ever christ came a light that whosoever believeth on him should not dwell in darkness and those that don't will dwell forever and ever in torment in outer darkness that's a promise of scriptures and this is why we go and this is why we compel those to come in this is why we do our best to reason with people. People say, hey, I don't want to waste your time. And I say, it's not a waste of time. I want you to understand these things. I want you to trust Christ today. I want you to believe on Christ today. I will stay here as long as you're willing to listen and to give me an opportunity to point you to the Savior, to point you to the Savior, to point you to the Lord Jesus so that you never have to see the white throne and him that sits on it. Because if you face him that sits on the white throne, all he has to judge you by is the book. And if you're judged by the book, you're condemned and you're burning. That's it. You're done. <laughs> Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Or face eternal judgment and condemnation. Thus saith the Lord. I thank you, Father, for this day.